Well, good morning. Glad everyone could make it today. Appreciate y'all being here. Um, we are getting closer and closer to Easter, a special time of year, and uh, as the church celebrates <clears throat> the resurrection and our Lord and Savior's uh, crucifixion and what that meant on the cross, you know, we're going to get into that a little more week by week. And then, of course, the empty tomb. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about Peter, that disciple that uh, speaks a lot. In fact, he is in the New Testament, other than the Apostle Paul, uh, as far as a disciple, he speaks out quite a bit. And, you know, he's kind of the spokesman. But uh, something about Peter you know, has always intrigued me. And uh, if you have your Bibles uh, open to Matthew uh, chapter 26, and then we're also going to be looking at Luke 22. So let's have a word. Father God, thank you for this day. Lord, as we open your word, may your Holy Spirit move among your people. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. I want to ask if, if you've ever noticed in life, and maybe you have just subconsciously, um, how often are we compared and evaluated in our lives? How are we compared to other people growing up? From the day we're born, you're being compared, whether you know it or not. You know, your mother says, uh, you know, Paul is walking. And then your aunt says, but uh, Ronnie is talking. <laughs> so there's this, not a rivalry, but there's just this comparison of people. And, and all through school, we're being compared, we're being evaluated by teachers, by coaches, if if you had the honor of serving in our great nation in the military, uh, you've been compared and evaluated uh, every way there can be. And your officers are always, always looking and evaluating who among the ranks um, can get the mission accomplished. So this comparison and this evaluation goes on again through life whether you recognize it or not, as you do to other people. Now, Peter comes on the scene and he's introduced to the Lord through his brother. You compare him to the Apostle Paul. In the post Resurrection, after the resurrection, you have Peter carrying the gospel. You have the apostle Paul, who was Saul at that time, persecuting the church. One has changed and the other has not. But soon... Saul becomes Paul. And his mission is to go to the Gentiles. And he changes his name from Saul to Paul. Meanwhile, Peter, he's going to go to the Jews. A blue collar fisherman is going to go to the Jews who have the Old Testament, who have the law who understand Judaism, many of them probably much better than him. Meanwhile, you have the guy with a perfect resume to go to the Jews. And we learned that in Philippians and his resume, that he was a, Paul was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was uh, a teacher of the law. He was a Pharisee. 
And I said last month that resume means nothing. It's garbage compared to his calling to follow Christ and to carry the gospel to the Gentiles. Paul would write 13 books in the New Testament. Meanwhile, Peter, he's going to spend three years walking with Jesus and learning firsthand from our Lord the important things of life, the important things of ministry, preparing all of his disciples for the time that would come in the upper room, all of that in preparation. So Peter has three years to on-the-job training, education from our Lord about what is going on. When Saul uh, fell down in Acts 9 on the road to Damascus, He had an encounter with the Lord, the risen Lord. And he was pretty bold after that. No more persecuting the church. His whole focus was to serve Jesus Christ now. His on-job on the, on the job training was pretty quick. And so this comparison between Peter and Paul, you can't help but think when you read the book of Acts and we see this kind of ebb and flow between these two great servants of the Lord, servants of the kingdom. <clears throat> but Peter had a downside. Sometimes he spoke without thinking. Sometimes he was irrational. Sometimes <clears throat> I think he had good intentions, but he even told the Lord how things were going to be. And we look at it in Matthew chapter 26. If you have that, look at verse 30. Matthew 26, 30. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the, serp, uh, the uh, shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. 32 is very important. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. I mean, Jesus knew he was going to be raised. I'm going to rendezvous with you guys. This isn't the end of it. 33, but Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you this night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the, the uh, disciples. What does this mean? Well, is Peter being irrational? Yes. Is he thinking about what he would do in something that I don't think he fully grasped the severity of the situation. He does not know what Jesus knows. Jesus knows that his time is short. It's a matter of hours. Peter doesn't. Even at the Last Supper, when they're sharing the, the meal, <clears throat> they're talking about things like who's going to be the greatest. And Jesus has to bring these guys down back to, to earth and say, gosh, y'all still don't get it. I'm going to the cross. He just quoted Zechariah 13, 7. 
that the shepherd will be stru struck or stricken and the flock will scatter. He's talking about these guys. He's talking about when he's arrested and he is taken, mocked, and crucified, every one of them's going to scatter. They are the sheep that's going to scatter. I find it interesting in reading that, that Peter is so bold, but it's misdirected. His faith is not where it needs to be because he's talking and bragging about himself and what he's going to do in a situation that I don't think he fully understands. And he basically says, even if all of these guys stumble, I will not. And if need be, I'm going, I'm prepared to die. And he says something that at the time I'm sure he was very sincere, but he says, I'll never deny you. Now, like many things in life, someone says something to you that is just outrageous, something you know isn't going to happen, maybe something impossible, but they really believe it. In their heart, in their mind, in their lips, they say, this, I'll do this, or I'll never do that. And you know that isn't true. And sometimes we, to keep the peace, whether it's with family, spouses, friends, co-workers, we don't address it. We just let it go. Say, okay, okay. Jesus has to push back with the prediction that Peter, your faith, your boldness, that's good. The problem is you've gone too far now. You will deny me. Before the rooster crows, not once, not twice, but three times. And we know in Scripture that happened. So Jesus, his prophecy was basically, Peter, get a hold of yourself. I really do believe Peter does not at this moment. He will later. But at this moment, he does not know who he is in relationship with Jesus Christ. Even after three years of walking and seeing the miracles and the wonders and the things that Jesus Christ did, yet Peter can still make bold statements like this, but it's empty. There's no way he understands what's around the corner, what's going to happen in just a very short period of time. So, when Peter <clears throat> says that uh, I'm going to die with you, I will not deny you, Notice in verse 35, it says, and so said all the disciples. So it's not just Peter. All the disciples say same thing. No, Lord, we're with you. We're with you all the way. But he says to Peter, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. You can mark that down. I tend to think that the Lord, the Lord is looking in Peter and in his heart the same thing the Lord looks at us. He's looking for that faith. He's looking for that loyalty. He's looking for that ability to rise above self and think about the kingdom. Think about others. Think about what you can do to serve me and stop thinking of yourself. Uh, we know, obviously, when, when the arrest happened, Peter, again, being bold, pulled out a knife and cut off the ear of the servant uh, Malchus. 
the last recorded miracle before the crucifixion occurs when Jesus heals that servant's ear. And it's recorded. Now, Peter believes he's doing the right thing with physical confrontation. But that doesn't work. And Jesus points that out to him immediately. Your faith, your loyalty is misdirected. All Jesus asked Peter to do that night when they went to the garden was what? To pray. That's all he asked Peter to do. Stay here, watch, and pray. And, of course, Peter and the other disciples fell asleep, and he comes back a second time and a third time. That's all he's asking Peter to do. He's not telling Peter, let's start a war. Let's go kill somebody because they're going to come to arrest me. No. Just pray. Just pray and understand that what I'm doing is what my Father wants me to do. I'm going to the cross. I am going to be sacrificed for the sin of the world. And I'm okay with that. Because that's what my father wants. Peter, you're trying to please me by saying that you will even die for me. I don't need you to die for me. I need you to pray. I need you to be strengthened because there's going to be a come there's going to come a time when Peter in the future his life is going to be on the line not because he started a war but because he faithfully served the Lord in the kingdom and carried the gospel and because of that he will be executed because he's a threat. He was trying to teach Peter to pray and to understand the spiritual dimension that is there. That spiritual dimension in prayer changes things in the visible. Now, I was talking about comparison. If you would, look at uh, Luke chapter 22. We have a similar account that Luke is writing. Luke 22. And by the way, this, this account of Peter denying Christ occurs in all the Gospels, also in Mark 14, in John 13, but in Luke 22, let's look at verse 31, Luke 22, 31, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthened your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day before you will deny me three times that you will, that you even know me. Luke's take on this, his account led by the Holy Spirit, There's a couple things in here in verse 31 you need to know about. When he talks to Peter by name, the word there, you, in the Greek is pearl in the second person. If you have a 
NLT, it probably says each of the disciples. If you have the NIV, it says all of the disciples. He's calling out Peter, but he's talking to all the disciples that Satan wants to sift you as wheat. You're my guys for three years. You are the people the, that I have chosen to mentor, to share my life, to share the mission my father has called me to do. And I have chosen you. And now is the time I need you. And because I need you, Satan wants to sift you as wheat. That is to visibly shake you. For you lose faith in who you are in relationship to me. Now he's laying all of this out to the disciples that night. And what do these guys do? They start talking about who's going to be the greatest. They start arguing amongst themselves who's going to be the greatest in glory. I, um, <clears throat> I'm always amazed. You, when I read emails, and if you're like me, my wife and I talk about this every now and then, uh, emails, texting, um, or horrible ways of communication, my opinion. Uh, if you're sharing just quick information, that's one thing. But if you're writing an email or a text to someone, that person receiving it can't discern if you're being sarcastic. They don't know tonality, you know, the tone in your voice. Um, they don't understand uh, maybe that you're joking or your body language because they can't see you and talk to you. It's through the written text. So sometimes you get a text or an email and you have to read it three, four, five times and say, what exactly are they saying? And before you reply, you want to make sure you're obviously saying something accurate that you understand it. And the only thing worse than that is the emails where I send to someone and I ask three questions and they reply and they only answer one question. And then I have to send it again and say, what about question number two, question number three? Uh, we get lazy sometimes in communication and that's, that's too bad, but that's our culture right now. It's great for quick information, but if... If you're trying to tell a story to someone or give very um, um, pertinent instructions, directions to go do something, uh, sometimes it's just better pick up the phone and do it the old way. Now, when I read this, and I read that the disciples are debating among themselves who's, who's going to be the greatest, Scripture doesn't say it, but I can't help but the body language of our Lord. He's shaking his head. These guys still do not get it. After everything I've poured into them for three years, all the miracles, all the exchanges I had with the rich young ruler and with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, and everything they saw, the, the miracles, the raising of Lazarus and others. And yet we get right down to the Last Supper. And these guys are talking about themselves. Folks, this isn't about us. It's about him. Now, we're born, we live, we make a million decisions in our lives. The moment, the moment we make the biggest decision in our life to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, now we have, as I said before, a spiritual dimension. We are born again. 
Our spirit that was dead is now alive, according to Ephesians. And the whole world changed. Now we're focused and should be focused on him. What does he want me to do? Where does he want me to go? And opportunities I have to share the gospel. If I only think about myself, I think about work. I think about fun. I think about hobbies. I think about making money, spending money, investing money. Nothing wrong with any of that. Except when it's number one in your life and Jesus Christ is second, third, fifth, twelfth. Now we got a problem. Now we're no different than these disciples thinking about themselves. He is about to go to the cross. And he needs every minute of these final hours to pour into them and get them to understand that their life is about to change. If he died and did not raise from the dead, these guys are free to go do whatever they want. But when they went, and Peter was one of them, and looked into with the stone turned away and looked into an empty tomb, and then later the Lord comes to them several times, their lives have changed. They now, after Pentecost, after the upper room, after the filling of the Holy Spirit, they now have a target on their backs with the enemy. When Jesus Christ says, Satan has asked that you be sifted as wheat, it's to shake their faith for them to lose focus of what's coming next. Did he not do that in the Old Testament, but in a different way? Satan, that is. Did he not in the first chapter of Job and in the second chapter of Job, did he not come to the Lord and ask permission Using Job as an example because the Lord pointed out, have you noticed my, my blameless, righteous man who serves me? And, of course, Satan gives him all the excuses. Well, 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 he doesn't have anything to fear because you just, you protect him, you provide for him, you bless him. Boy, you just let me get my hands on him and he'll curse your name. The Lord says, you're on. I have confidence in Job. He's going to pass the test. You can do this, but don't kill him. You can later, you can do this, but don't kill him. Likewise, Satan wanted to sift Job like wheat to where Job would lose faith, lose his integrity, lose his relationship with the Lord and curse the Lord. And he did not. This threefold denial that Peter did, let's talk about that. Let's do a little deeper dive into the tactics of the wolf to attack the sheep. He does it three ways, and there's others, but these are the three main ways. Sin, suffering, and success. Turn, if you would, to James chapter 1. That's right after Hebrews. James chapter 1. In verse 13, James chapter 1, 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. 
For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So one tactic Satan uses is sin, the most obvious one. Whether that be lust, whether that be um, uh, envy or jealousy, any of those kind of things, those emotions, anger, where the Lord, let's put it this way. The Lord, if you're born again, the Lord has a plan for your life. That's rock solid, folks. That's rock solid. Satan cannot take that away. What he can do is buffer you. He can come in a variety of ways and attack you. He can discourage you. He wants to sift you as wheat, but the Lord isn't going to allow that. You see, with Job, he had to give Satan permission. With Peter, the Lord himself prayed for Peter and said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. No, Lord, no, 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 no. You got it wrong. I'll never deny you. I'll... I'll go to prison for you. I'll die for you. I'll do whatever it takes because I'm Peter. No, you got it wrong, Peter. Your faith, what little faith you have right now is misdirected. I think when we look at sin as believers, not as lost people, believers, In James, what I just read, that temptation is there. The question is, what do you do with the temptation? It is not a sin to be tempted. It's a, it's a sin to fulfill that temptation, to carry forth that temptation and actually do the sin. That's what James is talking about. Suffering. Second tactic of the wolf to attack the sheep. We all suffer, folks. We all suffer. There's not a family in this church that has not, has not been affected by suffering. Whether that is emotional suffering, physical suffering, financial suffering, whatever. All of us. And in those times of suffering, when we're grieving for the lost loved one, or perhaps we're facing bankruptcy, or perhaps the doctor gives you a bad report, that's suffering. We don't turn to ourselves like Peter does or the disciples. We turn to the Lord. Lord, I don't understand this. But the enemy is always there. Always there, folks. To say, look at what he did to you. Aren't you special to him? You may not be Job. You may not be Peter or Paul. But you're one of his children. And you're suffering my, my, my. Is he too busy? Is he not strong enough, powerful enough to change this? Is he not interested? Oh my gosh, there are billions of Christians. He just, he lost track of you. You dropped off the radar. Is that how we feel when we suffer? Or do we? I've always said this. Always. Put it down. When you go through suffering and it's traumatic, 
suffering. You either pull closer to the Lord or you pull away. Happens all the time, even to pastors, preachers, strong believers. Every one of us have, has a blind spot, a blind spot that I think the enemy knows. He knows your life. He knows those things just like the Lord does. But at some point, at some point, we have to rise up and have faith that we can overcome this. Not because of our strength, because of his strength and his power and his love and mercy to you and me. It's the only thing that's going to get me through. If you've gone through a depression, and I mean a depression and not temporarily depressed, but a depression, the only thing that's going to get you through is prayer, the Holy Spirit, and loved ones who pray for you. Now, the doctor says take some medicine, this, that's between you and your doctor. Uh, you make that decision. Third one is success. Third tactic of the wolf to attack the sheep, success. For those believers who get to that fruitful season of their life where they have money now, they've worked hard, and they have money and everything is just going smooth, smooth watch out for the enemy he's over the horizon because if you're not careful it can go away it can go away and you have to realize that the blessings God gives you are his blessings. Nothing you earn, nothing you work for. He does it because he loves you and me. And we get through sin, suffering, and success. The enemy is always looking for those opportunities, but it's the Lord that we move to, that we count on, and the Holy Spirit in our lives every day that we have to trust and obey, just like the old Baptist hymn. Trust and obey, or there's no other way. You know, without Jesus, I would be nothing. I'd be successful in my career, successful in many other things, my goals, but I would be nothing without Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. And folks, I love you, but if you're honest with yourself, you have to say the same thing. If you don't say the same thing, then it's all about you. And that's what Peter is saying. It's all about him. He is so has so much bravado that he will even die for Jesus Christ. I'll be there on that cross right next to you. Only he had no idea what was around the corner. And of course, you can talk all you want, but the truth is in action. And when the arrest came, Peter did what he did, and he's gone. Don't do that. Don't let the Lord lay upon your heart what you should be doing to serve the kingdom and then you talk yourself out of it because of circumstances. Weakness and fear got the better of Pe Peter. And because of that, he's in all four Gospels. But he had a miraculous Spirit-filled turnaround when you get to the book of Acts, as did comparing to Saul who became Paul.
I want to leave you with this. We kind of beat up Peter sometimes. He's an easy target. He's impatient. He um, speaks without thinking. And as I just said, he promises things he cannot deliver. Folks, do not promise God in your prayer time something you cannot deliver. The reason I say that, that if you do not deliver, then you become discouraged. And when you become discouraged, you start tuning out. You lose faith. You lose heart. I don't know what the future holds in our country, in our world, but I know who has the answers to all the questions about tomorrow. Go today. Pray. Strengthen yourselves in the Word of God. And know that He loves you and He'll never forsake you.